Hoorah! All right, Rich Sire and I are back with more on Mr. Pliskin. Welcome. I thought, Welcome to the show. I thought he was dead. <laughs> right. No one kills the snake. <laughs> Uh, so uh, thank you thank you very much for having me on the show i know we've been going back and forth trying to get this set up we're finally doing it and i'm excited to be here because i am a huge fan of anything john carpenter and i definitely love the snake plissken escape from new york movies oh totally and uh so what would you s describe yourself as an 80s guy kid or were you just kind of more just whatever worked <laughs> More of a 70s. I, I love the 70s and 80s, but I think for me, the 70s movies were the best. But so I, I'm, I'm 54 now, so I was born in 68. So I, like, I was probably like, I was seven when Jaws came out. And that was like the first movie that I was in first grade. My parents took me to see it 17 times in the theater. And that's like, you know, the obviously the birth of the blockbuster. But my father <laughs> was also great in the fact that he used to take my brothers and I to every horror movie like phantasm evil dead and they say oh, i don't know if your kids could i don't know if your kids can handle it my kids can take and get them a ticket so the reason i'm telling you all this is that my father at a very young age got me um interested in the john carpenter movie starting with assault and precinct 13 halloween the fog and then i just kept on going i said this guy is great i love the thing i love about john carpenter is his simplicity and i just, yeah he was a fan of like basically for the do-it-yourself kind, and this was even coming up even a few years uh, before, like you say, Don Cuscarelli and Sam Raimi and even Joe Dante are also making it big, but they're all kind of, along with Cronenberg, kind of like one side of the same coin, really, if you really boil it down. You know? Oh, exactly, and I'm a huge fan of Cronenberg. I'm, obviously, we mentioned Cuscarelli and Raimi with Evil Dead and Phantasm. So, yeah, so I just, I love the fact that they're, they're original and they they create these characters that are extremely memorable. I mean, like Coscarelli with the tall man, Evil Dead with Ash. So John Carpenter is just, I mean, Snake Plissken's one of my like probably, I mean, he's done so many great movies. It was funny. Just last night I was watching The Prince of Darkness, and I live in Connecticut. I'm not sure where you are, but uh, Dallas. Uh, it's all good. Okay. Yeah. So I I um they have this thing called Connecticut Cold Classics. They play different horror movies. They had John Carpenter night. So they played in the mouth of madness along with the fog. And so I just, I've been on this John Carpenter kick lately. So this is a perfect time for me to do this. And uh, I think that, you know, I just kept, when I got hooked on the first movie, you know, then I kept, and when Escape from New York came out, it just, first of all, has an excellent cast. I mean, yes. Kurt Russell is great in everything he does. But then you have the Duke, the Isaac mm -hmm. Hayes, yep. Ernest Borgnine, the taxi driver. I mean, I can go on and on. The list, Adrian Barbeau is great in everything. And, Yep. People who are watching this, I do have a podcast. It's called, it's on um, iTunes. I'm through a little self-promotion, if you don't mind. There's a reason Anytime. I bring this up. I interviewed Adrian Barbeau, who was obviously in Escape from New York, and she was married to John Carpenter. But uh, you can find it. It's called The Claws Corner. You can find it on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, Audible, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, mm -hmm. and several Connecticut radio stations if you're in Connecticut. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> So, but yeah, Adrian, we, we talked a lot about, obviously she has a, a long history with Jack Carpenter and then they have a son Cody together and they do the music. And so we, we talked a lot about being in, in his movies and how great he is. And actually um, I interviewed Tom G. Waits, who was in the thing with Jack Carpenter. We talked about there what you a go. great director he is. And he said that the one good thing or not one good thing, one of the many good things about Jack Carpenter is that he lets you be an actor like the example would be he said that uh his, his name was windows in the movie and so uh, in the thing <laughs> and so he says well it was something else and he goes hey john he goes yeah he goes, from now on i want to be called windows he said he just looked at him took a long drag of a cigarette blew out the smoke and said all right from now on he's called windows everybody and that was it he said you've just so mellow and such a great person to work with that's and uh, and it makes sense too because i mean if you listen to their commentary for the thing all they're doing is just pulling each other's leg the entire time <laughs> oh yeah exactly yeah and uh and with with uh escape from you know what's funny about escape from new york i, I mean the movie was what 1981 i think 
Yeah, and it's set in ninety seven. <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna say set in nineteen ninety seven, and that's when they thought they, that's when the the world was gonna be like that. So, that's so coincidentally the when the first comic came out too. It was after Escape L.A. came out, and they said, "Hey, let's fill in the blanks. What was he doing in those sixteen years between Escape L.A. and New York, or New York and L.A.?" And you know, Adventures is pretty much just he's robbing the cdc that's meta even more meta nowadays if you think about it but yeah he's, uh, he's just getting a bunch of different stuff he's almost kind of like john connor and her t free uh right yeah. machines and it, it's interesting how he's just tracking a few different robots that can imprint their personas and it's literally one giant lethal weapon movie you just read the whole thing and then you get to the 2003 comic which is just pluskin chronicles and it's Basically, he's assigned by these bizarre, even more bizarre thieves to uh, try and get to Atlantic City while also stealing a car that JFK was assassinated in from a oh casino God. and then deliver it to a yacht on the Gulf. And just reading that aloud, I mean, it makes sense when you read it in the comic, but when you actually sit down and t- think about it, it's like, who came up with just such a crafty thing? But at the same time, you can understand why they thought it was worthy of the name. All right, so question for you, because uh, as I mentioned off the air, I said I love the movies, and I'm sure I would love the comics, but I didn't read the comics. So the question I have for you is, did John Carpenter have anything to do with the comics? I think he gave his blessing. Now, as a side scroll, he did, this is a good transition, he did approve of uh, the uh, Fliskin and... Uh, Jack Burden crossover. He was like, "Man, I couldn't do it better." <laughs> wow, yeah, and that says a lot because, like, this is like the the Burden there. There was a Jack Burden standalone comic, which was basically a bunch of, of unrelated anthologies, and he just shows up in them various throughout. Uh, but uh, when they when they teamed them up and they had them in uh, the uh, just crossover together, like it, it was like it would be like if you had two, you know, Han Solo and Indiana Jones, you know, fighting crime together, just like perfectly illustrated and uh, just worthy of the crossover. Uh, I will say, I do feel like Burden's kind of underutilized at times because, you know, it's an ensemble movie while Escape New York is kind of, you know, he's the main guy uh, guy leading the show, but everyone else also has some good lines. Uh, but, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, like here... Uh, with them constantly saying, hey, let's do a remake. No, let's do a reboot where we'll have an excuse to have The Rock and uh, Russell come back. And I'm just like, uh, I just hope that they just, they don't touch this anymore. Just continue it in comic books. Like, that's the what the place for it. Kind of like RoboCop. <laughs> just uh, Exactly. I, I just wished, I mean, somebody made a great comment. They, um, because they said, why can't anybody come up with new ideas? They always have to just, and in, in, I think Kevin Smith said this, and it's so true. They don't really care about the quality of the movies for the most part. All they do care about is getting people in the seats to make their money because the name recognition. Then they say, okay, all they next care about. movie. So they, yeah, and it's just, it's, it's sad. It's like, I'd rather see a brand new concept, brand new characters, brand new story, and create something instead of just, the same because I mean to me there's very rarely a reboot remix remake that is better than the original the only only reason I like some of these reboots is because it brings attention to people who never even realized there was an original and they're like oh wow let me check out this one and that's exactly yeah so with with Escape from New York please just leave it alone you know what I'm impressed with because what year did Escape from LA come out uh 96 all right, so he they did the first one, 81. Second one came out in 96. Kurt Russell said he was able to fit into the same Snake Plissken suit. He that really he did. didn't look like he aged all that much in between no. our movie, which is so weird because you look at anyone else who went from the 80s and 90s, you could tell. And Russell just seemed to like he just always had that same brunette hair and he just kept working out with all these martial yeah. artists. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, I, I, some people, I think that probably the more the purest, like, oh, the remake, or not the remake, the sequel really wasn't as good. I liked Escape from L.A. I thought it was a fun movie. Peter Fonda riding the waves. I thought it was just fun. They're and so that's... different, too. So yeah. it's just kind of like, I mean, if I'm going to talk smack about it, it better be just, I don't know, a missed opportunity. But 
I feel like they're having fun. I mean, just watching the trailer alone, I mean, they would air them nonstop on uh, just Fox stations and sci-fi channel. They were, it was very common to know people who had seen them. You know? <laughs> oh, yeah. And, and the movie is good for people maybe who were t- too young and didn't see the first one. You could see the second one as a standalone. You could still enjoy it without being, what? I don't understand this. What is it's it? It's kind of like Evil Dead where like, you know, Evil Dead 2 was kind of a part remake, part sequel. You know, it was yeah. just like it was like a director's cut and a follow up. And it's like you say, it, it stood on its own two feet. And it is wild how both it and Predator 2 are tied with uh, just deciding, hey, you know, we got our own apocalyptic version of 97, even though it's a few years away. <laughs> they just embraced it back then with that alternate timeline. <laughs> yeah. No, so I, I could, there's really nothing I could say bad about either movie. I love Escape from New York. I'm a huge fan of Escape from L.A. And you know, I just love the snake character in general. And, of course, Donald Pleasance is great in everything he does. To me, he's so over the top in everything. That's what I love about him. Yeah. Uh, years before Harrison Ford was playing the president, we had a president who decides, I got him, I got him. Ah! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, uh, and then, like you say, I mean – they're all kind of very self-aware. Like Pliskin is aware of that of how society views them and the government guys are aware of their con, but they still will find a way to kind of shit down everyone's throat and say, Oh no, no, <laughs> we got yeah, this. Yeah, and it's like, no, you don't, you don't got this. <laughs> so in the, in the comics, um, I know you explained to, to, or any of the other characters in the, in the comics. Uh, not particularly, but they do acknowledge the government. And I like that. Just build on the world. Make use of the comic book stature. It's not just them fancily drawing Russell's approved, you know, persona. Like, they really go to town with it. Like, really making sure to just uh, describe uh, what's changed since then. Fill in the blanks. As well as just, uh, again, much like the RoboCop comics, they were really good at uh, replicating the style. Instead of just feeling like, hey, it's someone who's a casual fan but who doesn't really know the character, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So the, they're true to the story and they're true to the character. And they just, I, I like that. I'm, you know, I cannot, it's funny because after we end this, I'm going to go watch, rewatch both movies and buy all <laughs> the comics now. I'm, I'm really excited. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious to see what they did with the comics. And I've always, you know, it's funny because I've seen them. I just never really bought them. And I just, because I, I do love comics, but I just, and, and I, for some reason, I just never really got into them. But I, I'm I, I'm curious the more we're talking about it. I want to mm-hmm. see what they do with it. Oh, totally. I, I, I don't think it'll be let down at all. And uh, all together, I mean, uh why, why do you think uh, Little China has been so popular? Do you think it's just mainly just with how it shows kind of a blue collar character mixed in with a just all these other mixture of Hong Kong, Shaw Brothers, Kung Fu? and Yeah, I, I think that you just worded it perfectly. That's a great because, you know, people love action. They love comedy. They love martial arts. And this movie has all of that. The, the characters are great. The story is good. Joel Silver it's got produced it. <laughs> you know, he he's a big, big movie guy when he signs on to do something like Commando or Tyler. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, definitely. Tells from so, the crib, so, yeah. When you have his name attached to it, and John Carpenter, Kurt Russell, it's just it's such a great... And what's, I, I was watching Prince of Darkness last night. I can't remember his name. Was it Alex Wong? I uh, think so. Yeah, yeah. I think he because I know he was in that movie too. It's another one I haven't seen in a long time, but I I know it so well because I've seen it so many times. It's just that I know that he was. It's, it's just uh, I think that that what what keeps it still relevant still is that it's a genuinely good movie. Mm-hmm. And it's not it's not cheaply done. It's not cheesy. I mean, it might, it might be cheesy in a in a fun way. Like you know what I mean? It's just like John Carpenter. I love like we mentioned with Escape from New York. I love his sense of humor. Like throughout the whole movie. Hey, I thought you were dead. They told me you were dead, Snake. It's just to keep on. Like, they always have these one. Oh, it's funny the way he he throws these different things in. The, like um, like you mentioned from other characters had the classic lines, and uh, I think I think uh, just like they live and other movies that he's done after Escape from New York, that fits right in with uh, 
with everything that people like. Oh, totally. And I, I, so who's, uh, let, let's, let's answer this long question. Uh, so would he win in a fight against Solid Snake from the Metal Gear games, which are inspired by him? Wait, what was that last question? I'm sorry. What, would Snake Plissken win a fight against Solid Snake from Metal Gear Solid? <laughs> Ooh, that is a tough one. I'm going to say. They're both inspired, you know. I, I know. I may be a little um, impartial <laughs> with this, but I'm going to go with Snake. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think Snake Plissken, maybe the other guy, maybe the other one's a little bit tougher, but Snake is more uh, cunning. And snake has to do what he, whatever it needs to be done to to win and and, and survive mm-hmm. okay cool <laughs> that would, there you got it <laughs> that'd be my take on that <laughs> well, what about you what's your opinion uh, i think snake could probably win a gunfight but pliskin would probably win a knife fight you know <laughs> oh yeah definitely I I agree with you. It's it's, it's uh it'd be a toss up. But I'm gonna go with Snake. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh man! But altogether, I mean, uh, it seemed like we had rumors for forever on what uh, different movies and shows uh, were trying to uh, bring uh, his persona back and. I've seen some people even joke, hey, you know, you could get Wyatt Russell. I personally would have preferred a Gerard Butler type. I think that's as close as you're going to get to a Russell type, even though Russell's still working. But yeah, uh, I'm, I'm glad they haven't successfully remade it yet. And just, <laughs> you know, it's going to be similar to the last couple Evil Deads. I enjoy them, but they're not Evil Deads to me. They're not really, you know, it doesn't have the same, mm-hmm. you know, without Bruce Campbell, it's the me, same it's way with Evil Dead. Star have... Trek where I'm like, hey, there's a reason it's a mirror universe. It's not part of the main timeline, so it's not really all that relevant. But Exactly, hey, yeah. So there at is... least I get these new shows because of that one's success. Same thing with Mission Impossible. People are going back and watching the OG TV show. You know? Yeah. Now they've seen the Tom Cruise movies that have amazing stunts, but again, you know, if you don't like him as a person, you're probably not going to like those movies. You know? Yeah, so I, I'm, I, I, I do enjoy the Mission Impossible movies, and it, it, may, it does make it even more impressive for me knowing that Tom Cruise is doing his own stunts. I've seen, I've, seen, I mean, I like him as an actor, so I, I, I'm, I'm not one of those people. I can really, for me, I don't really care what the person does off screen as long as they're good on screen. Like, I'm not going <laughs> to judge. I'm not going to hate a movie just because what he does off screen people disagree with. So that's like I know a lot of people hate Christian Bale. But to me, I think he's one of the best actors out there right now. Oh yeah, I. There's no way around it. I mean, he's a character off screen, but he's a great actor. So it's just like, yeah, I mean, I, I think everyone's had enough time to just separate him from, uh, you know, his persona, yeah. but it wasn't easy. It was just kind of, we were all kind of adjusting to various things where, where we were realizing, oh, so this is how this works. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and like the, the big thing is, uh, you know, with, with Tom Cruise is the uh, jumping on the couch. How many years ago with Katie Holmes? <laughs> Scientology, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so, I mean, I can really care less if he believes that some alien is waiting for him. As long as <laughs> as long as long on the screen, he's uh, jumping off cliffs on his motorcycle, I'm happy. <laughs> there you but, go. But yeah, so but getting back to the other question, yeah, it's just, it, it might, just like Assault and Precinct 13. It was, the remake was a good movie, but it was not Assault, Assault and Precinct 13 to me. It was just, Fair enough. Yeah. It didn't have the same charm, didn't have the same, I don't know, the same feel to it it was just an, an a good movie but it and i call that no way, training day part two yeah exactly exactly that's a perfect way to put it <laughs> jake went undercover again and get found more trouble <laughs> yeah so it's just uh i i'm really hoping is like you said they don't do that and it seems like now they're going more with the streaming so either it'd be direct to streaming or maybe like a hulu series or something which i don't know i'd that, yeah, that's pretty much it. Like they're only willing to take that amount of chances now. <laughs> well, you know, I'm, I'm actually with Spielberg on what I'm going to say next because uh, there was a movie I can't remember the name of it, but it won Best Picture. And it was on Netflix, and he goes, "If it's not in the theater, it should not win an Oscar." He goes, "That's a made-for-TV movie," and I, I agree with him on that. As I know, it's changed. Times are changing, and that's how a lot of movies, you know, are seen now. But 
I had, and all the work people put in inside the theater and then this you know movie that somebody puts on a streaming service what's your opinion on that i you know i'm kind of for either side uh, i'll really the all, this is a systematic problem kind of like how when we want to deal with various things like the problem with hr isn't that it's not compromised i mean far from it you know when you're reporting issues at a job uh, the issue is that the people behind the desk actually don't want to do their job because it's a lot of work having to yeah. fire people, give them severance pay when you could do that and be done with them instead of constantly trying to replace them or get them fired or wait for them to not show after workers have to take abuse from them. So I think, yeah, I mean, Netflix is the problem behind this. It's not, I mean, them and the investors. It, it's not so much where it's being sent so much as it is that once your movie gets bought, they love to just kind of sweat the small stuff and just keep you in the dark. Like HBO Max has been a total, has kind of been joining Netflix in terms of pissing so many production companies off. Oh, yeah. By not telling them ahead of time if you're getting canceled or we're buying it, but it's never going to be aired. We're literally throwing it in the garbage. So, <laughs> and so I feel, you know, I'm cool with whatever you do, just don't send your movie straight to the internet and then act like oh i want to win emmys or golden gloves like no bullshit that's like asking to win an oscar for your directed video movie don't pull that shit and i mean when they did it with you know netflix is mainly the main instigator they're doing the whole oh you know we only want it to be in five theaters for two weeks and it's like well then <laughs> you're not proud of your movie clearly spend more money exactly. on that you know amazon <laughs> will do that they got money to burn but they, they, you know, I, I, I have yet to hear, you know, they're always relaunching their site. You know, this, these last two years, they decided no more crappy movies, you know. And so Tubi kind of did their illustration. We have everything and, you know, do with that what you will. And they're doing original stuff in addition to that, as well as cult TV shows that are very easy to get into, especially after hard days work. So, yeah, it, it is kind of one of those. It's like if. You, you know, if you're going to be Mr. Christopher Nolan, then just say, OK, that's in my contract. I only do movies that are in theaters versus movies and TV and streaming, you know. Yeah, which I which I don't mind the stream. But like you you said, you said exactly what I was saying. It's like, well, don't expect to win an Oscar or an Emmy because it's that's completely different. Maybe you can win like best TV show or best streaming movie. They should have like another category because. That's why, you know, let's go back to Tom Cruise. And it, I, I love going <laughs> well, to the not, theater. No, I'm just kidding. Well, no, no, the reason I'm bringing this up is because <laughs> um, I know. he, I know. Top Gun 2 is supposed to come out, COVID hit, and he goes, I am not putting this in streaming services. I am going to wait until we put it in theater. And that was one of the biggest blockbusters in a long time. And they made a lot, of, and that actually brought people back to the theater. Even people who think, hated the original liked it. I didn't like it, but I can't deny yeah. the success that they were able to, I mean, I got to tip my hat to anybody who can do this to just get, I mean, look at Disney. They practically get free movies, uh, you know, and advertising with anything Star Wars or Marvel related, just because those fan bases are so huge. You put, yeah. you put its name in a title, people are going to watch it. So exactly. And for me, I, I, wasn't really a big of a fan of the first Top Gun. I did like the second one much better than the first one. I've been one. seeing a lot of that, and it's interesting to me because not every sequel can do that. Some, even movies, I mean, it's kind of the same thing with 21 Jump Street. There were plenty of people who never saw the Johnny Depp show, and then they see these uh, new oh, I know. movies, which are both kind of a loose spinoff, but also breaking the fourth wall. So, And then when Deadpool came along, then it was like a total return to breaking the fourth wall. Something yeah. that really had only been done on stuff like The Office, Larry Saunders, even Boston Legal. And then, you know, it was for certain movies and shows like Spinal Tap. And then now it's like second nature. Everyone's in on it. But it took a while. <laughs> like, same yeah. thing with that. Uh, they're always joking about what shows kind of predicted the Internet. Like some sometimes they'll say, you know, The Daily Show or even... Uh, at one other sitcom, uh, Mr. Science Theater might have inspired the internet we have nowadays where everyone's snappy and got various kinds of meta humor, different ways to joke. 
Yeah, no, definitely. You know what's funny about that? I, I prefer Rift Tracks, which is three guys from the original Mystery Science Theater. I think mm-hmm. that that is much funnier than... I think maybe because they found their groove, they've been doing it for so long now. And, and they're doing more recent movies as opposed to obscure yes. drive-through shit. Which I, I, I love it too. You know, one of my favorite shows growing up was... Uh, remember, do you remember Joe Bob Briggs? Yes. I used to love that. <laughs> that and Elvira, because they used to show these older movies. And they're still working today. That's the beauty. Yeah, because if you... Um, Shutter still has Joe Bob Briggs. It's uh, mm-hmm. for people who don't know. And Elvira like always gets service. going. She's always got a new book or a new convention appearance. It's just oh, yeah. wild. It really is. Yeah, she's going she's gonna to be at the Connecticut... I, I met her several times... And I didn't have, oh, nice. of course, at the time I didn't have a podcast, but I have, since I'm going to ask her to see if she'll do the show. She was really, really nice when I met her. That was in the 90s, though, so it's been a long time. She might remember you, you know, because uh, all she asked for is much like any celeb, you know, don't just come up to them and just like surprise them to where you're like, whoa, okay. <laughs> you know? <laughs> oh, yeah, no. You know, I, you know, it's funny. It's like, I, yeah, I do, I don't do that at all. Like, I'll just, I'll have a great conversation. And most of the time, the reason they do it, well, now it's, it's when they first started doing it, it was because like, wow, you know a lot about this. And they'll talk about movies that nobody really took. Because a lot of times people go and talk about like what's popular now. And I'll talk about like, remember in the 1975 movie you did? Really? I, I didn't even have this picture, but here, I, I, I wasn't even going to bring that. I think anybody knew about that. But now since I've interviewed people like D. Wallace, Adrian Barbeau, Max mm-hmm. Gale from Barney Miller, and you know, so on and so on, <laughs> they'll say, oh, you interviewed that person? I'll do the show. So it's much easier now that I've had some guests. But when I, I remember, I, I used to be in radio in the 90s. And this one, I met Elvira. She, she did a bumper for me. You know, I was like, hi, this is Elvira, Mistress of the Dark. And you're listening to Rich Sears. She was, she that's was really good. fucking awesome. That's, that's yeah. great. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm hoping to get her. But yeah, so the reason I brought her up was I, I always love stuff like that where they, and uh, I thought that was, oh, like I said, now, as you said, it's become more commonplace for people to do things like that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and but I, it wasn't always that way, unfortunately, but it's cool that it's now second nature now, you know, all, all of it is paid off just two decades later. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what, let's go back to John Carpenter for a second. What's your favorite John Carpenter movie? Oh man. Uh, I yeah. will definitely say they live. Just... Yes. I met Jesse, not just, oh my God, not Jesse Ventura. Um, what does it, Roddy Piper, Roddy, Roddy oh, Piper. Jealous. <laughs> oh, he, he was such a great guy. I remember, like he, he, we talked for a lot, and his son was there. His son at the time was an MMA fight. Actually, you know where I met him was in Dallas, Texas. Uh, at the oh, time, nice. I had a, I, I met a woman, and I was going to move to Texas, but we ended up breaking up, so I stayed in Connecticut. But yeah. I was, I was in <laughs> That's Texas. Funny how the dominoes fall where they do. <laughs> what was that? It's funny how the dominoes fall where they do. Oh yeah, exactly. You know, I'm, I'm actually yeah. happy. I'm, I'm, I'm actually sorry. happy how that worked out, but. Right. When I was down there with her, there was a convention and they had a Rowdy Rowdy there. And he, I, he talked for a long time. And that's when he was sick, unfortunately. I didn't realize he was sick at the time. He had that's cancer, dedication, but... though. I mean, to be able yeah. to entertain that many people while your days are numbered, though, that that's something. Yeah. And he didn't complain. He didn't say, like, oh, I feel like you know, sometimes you'd, you'd see people and they could just tell that they, Tom Savini, for instance, board is, de- <laughs> board is death and they have no interest in even talking to anybody being there. Like Linda Hamilton uh, was was like that. It was like, I'm what sorry. You, what are you even here for? Yeah. But um, he took the time to talk to everybody, took the time to like take a picture. He was, I mean, because normally they charge for pictures. He goes, come on, come on. We got to get a picture. It was me. My girlfriend at the time and her daughter. Goes, let's get a family picture. Come on, let's. I don't care about money. Let's just do it. He, he was like that. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, so that's another one. I wish I had a podcast at that time. But yeah, no, they. I love. They live. And you know, it's in funny. Another, are you, in a different world. <laughs> are you a fan of South Park? Oh, totally. Yeah. All right. So I'm sure you know that they did. They live scene by scene, like frame by frame, the with the crib fight. I think I do. Oh, get my god! That's right. Shit. Yep. <laughs> they did. <laughs> it's been a minute. Yeah. No, I know. This was an old episode. Uh, but I remember, like, I was laughing sort of because, like, a lot of times people, you know, that's what I love about South Park because the adults are laughing for one reason, the kids are laughing for another reason. Oh, yeah, the kids are laughing at just all the naughty the stuff jokes. while we're getting all the meta stuff. It's like, oh my God, they're just making fun of global warming. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, definitely. And, but I love their, you could tell that, I'm not sure how old you are, but like I said, I mentioned before, I'm 30s. 
Oh, 30s. Okay. Right. So I could, you could tell Matt and Trey are about my age because all the references they make are things that I grew up watching too. And I could tell that they had very similar tastes as me. We'll return after these messages. Hello and welcome to Culture Shocked, the pop culture podcast brought to you by four aging millennials and our outdated opinions. Join us every Tuesday as we discuss movies, TV, games, and even music, new and old. Dude, what do you think you're doing? Are you seriously trying to record a promo without us right now? Well, uh, yeah. Dude, you can't just do the promo by yourself. Who's going to listen to that? Yeah, and you probably haven't even told them that we're a pop culture podcast where we always agree on everything. Uh, for instance, the Sam Raimi trilogy easily being the best of the Spider-Man movies. J no, no. But I think we can all agree that Jaws is a classical masterpiece. Mm, nope, don't like that. But we do all agree that the sequel trilogy of Star Wars is the best in the Skywalker saga, right, guys? That comment is so ridiculous, I don't even know where to Anyways, uh, that'll do it from all of us here at Culture Shock. Thanks for listening. Hey, it's Brent Pope, the host of Breakfast with Brent Pope. You've seen me on some of your favorite TV shows saying things like, give it up, Jimmy. You got to sink this putt to win. On Breakfast with Brent Pope, I sit down with guests from the entertainment world, and we do it all over breakfast. Or should I say breakfast? Every week on Breakfast, you get inside Hollywood info and tips, great breakfast wrecks and booty debates. Most of all, you get the most delightful 30 minutes of your week. So dig in. It's Breakfast time. Listen at Breakfast.com, Apple Podcasts, or wherever fine podcasts are found. Do you ever find yourself thinking about who would win in a fight between Goku and Superman? Hi, I'm James Gavsey, and on the Who Would Win show, me and my co-host Ray ignore anything important happening in the outside world and debate fictional battles between characters from comics, movies, and video games. We got a new show every week, and almost always am I the winner. Yeah, <laughs> not true, Ray. In the past, we've discussed such matches as Captain America vs. Darth Vader, Solid Snake vs. the Iron Giant, classic matchups like RoboCop vs. Terminator, and even the Muppets vs. Sesame Street. That one was crazy. So if you're a fan of geek culture and love a spirited debate, check out the Who Would Win Show wherever you get your podcasts, or check us out at whowouldwinshow.com. We let things pile up in the DVR. We add them to our queues. We wait for the DVDs and Blu-rays. We time shift. The Time Shifters podcast sci-fi horror fantasy superheroes comedy action film television maybe some not so current events find us on itunes or at timeshifterspodcast.com cool thing about blind knowledge is we are in multiple countries we are worldwide all across the globe we are in the u.s we are in the uk we are in canada germany india japan we're in australia y'all blindknowledge.com now back to the feature presentation. Like They're a special like, kind of comedian where if they went too far, they wouldn't even have to own up to it. They would just be like, well, that didn't work. So we'll try something else. You know, it's just like so many comedians are just kind of getting in trouble or just talking too much. And they're just kind of like, uh, when we have something to say, well, We'll text you, you know, <laughs> like yeah. we'll, we'll make ourselves known. <laughs> well, you know, what's funny. I, what I like about them is they mentioned, and I think there's, there's a documentary. I'm not sure if this is the one where they mentioned it, but I, I read this somewhere. There's, there's one on HBO Max where they talk, it's basically they do one episode in one week. They start with the idea and the whole thing is done in one week. But they said that what they do is they'll say when they want to get away with, away with something, Something they don't even care about. Like, well, I can swear on this show, right? Yes. Fuck All right, fuck so they'll say, I want to <laughs> say shit 18 times. Like, well, you can't say shit 18 times, but I'll let you do the other thing you talked about. And that's basically what they were trying to get the censors to do. They were just saying, I want to do this. And then that's when Tim's like, well, let's, let's, let's uh, make a bargain here. We can't let you do that, but we'll let you do this. So they said they did that all the time, and that's how they got away with so much shit on that show. Where <laughs> No pun intended. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. And there was actually an episode where uh, – and you know what I love about it is because they make so many great – that's why – so many great points. Norman Lear directed one of their, their hundredth episode because he says, this is the best satire. And it's true because they make, they make so many great points. One example was – this is back in, I want to say, early 2000s. They were uh, 
which is even more relevant now where everybody's offended by everything, but they had a show where they were doing a Christmas pageant and they're like, well, we can't talk about baby Jesus. That's going to get the Jews um, angry. Then we can't talk about the Hanukkah because that's going to get the Christians mad. So basically they took everything out that got people offended. At the last thing, somebody in the audience goes, this is boring. Everybody walked out because there was nothing left to play. It's just, they, they make so many great points about how people are in the world. And I saw Book of Mormon twice. And anybody right. who's out there, that is probably, I mean, it won best uh, Tony for best play years ago. It definitely deserved it. The, the music oh, is great. The story is hilarious. Yeah. I, I can't but, imagine not having it in our world. I mean, it was so funny. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's why for pe- the only people that really hate that show are people that never saw it because if it makes it, it, it or there's people cursing. Just, oh, all they do is. And they hear like the little thing, oh, it's all that, that fat kid farting. It's like there's so much more to the show than that. <laughs> oh, totally. It, it's people are just absurd. Like they will just kind of let stuff annoy them, and it's like you're you're missing this just so much of this. And oh, yeah. I mean, half the time people would just kind of surrender if just anyone complained. They're just like, oh, well, uh, we've 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 gone too far. I'm sorry, sorry. It's like, no, no, don't be sorry. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny because I'm sure I don't know if you remember this. There was an episode where they were uh, they were making fun of a religion, the Muslim religion, and then it mm-hmm. ended up being Santa Claus. Yeah. So they were getting death threats and they wanted to and he goes, do not take the show off here. We make fun of it. We make fun of the Christians. We make fun of the Jews. We make fun of the Jews. But I'm not going to we're not going to not make fun of somebody just because we get a couple of death threats. And they stood by their ground and they. I think they aired the episode once, and of course, like you, you mentioned before, like, oh, we have to, we have to take this off. We don't want to offend anybody. And it really wasn't even offensive. It ended up being Santa Claus. It was a, a joke. Yeah. But I just love the fact that, and Isaac Hayes walked off the show, not for that episode, but for another reason because of, they were making fun of religion. Or well, I can't remember which episode it was, but in the beginning, <laughs> kids, you know, obviously, you know, he played chef, and uh. But he he was angry, and they're like, "Well, sorry, we're not going to change because somebody's offended." And I love that about them; they they stood by their beliefs, and that's I think that's what people have to do. I mean, because you don't have to go out to offend somebody just to offend somebody. But if you're making if you're making art and you you're doing it in a way that you want to do, you know, people love freedom of speech until it's something they don't agree with. That's what I hate. Well, and people got to reiterate what is free speech versus just getting yeah. angry 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 and then half the time when you're explaining to them they're getting even more angry as you're explaining it to them to where it's just like so you're acting like i wronged you but you asked me what this is about and it just seems like we just cannot win there's always going to be something that just and you know half the time you know don't get me wrong sometimes the comedians will instigate is like no 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 you were good just just let let the idiots hang themselves, but going in and out and calling them an idiot is only going to make them keep retaliating against you. <laughs> it's just like, let them make an ass of themselves instead of joining that club. <laughs> oh, exactly. Well, I mean, if that's what gets me mad was if these people that apologize and their show's taken off the air, it's mostly just two or three people that don't have a job and they're on the internet and they're keyboard warriors if, if, if you just ignored them for a week, people would completely forget about it. But then all of a sudden, the networks and everybody's so worried. Oh, we got to take this off. He pissed someone this. off on Twitter, even yeah. though the other guy was an idiot. This is like, well, so what are we doing here? What are we doing here? Yeah, no, it's it's it's, it's point. sad how easily the networks. Point. And you know what's funny? Because like, like one of my favorite creators of TV shows is Norman Lear. And if you watch his shows, like All in the Family, The Jeffersons, just those mm-hmm. two shows alone. I mean, he did so many more, like One Day at a Time. Yeah. And, but anyway, so just I'm going to stick with All in the Family and Jeffersons for a minute. I mean, the things that he does in those shows, if they ever did that now, he would have been canceled for life. But the show, he was basically showing ignorance mm-hmm. and making fun of it. He yeah. wasn't promoting ignorance. And he was he was showing, like, I'm... The George Jefferson side, that one, and then yeah. Archie Bunker. I mean, but you've seen both Boston sides Legal, right? What was that? Have you seen Boston Legal? Oh, I love that show. Sa- same difference, you know. It's just yeah. like they were. I mean, 
I, I think the reason that one's still popular is just kind of like The Office. You know, they they keep going, oh, we couldn't make it today. I'm like, but at least you were in on the joke. Like anyone who's a douche and wants to be just like Archie Bunker or Denny Crane, well, okay, so jokes on them. They don't, they didn't get the joke. But <laughs> you know, there's so many <laughs> other ways to go around this, and like you say, they <sighs> we can win. It's just a lot of people, like you say, choose to surrender or just not illustrate who's actually complaining and whether or not they actually get what's going on. <laughs> no, exactly. It's And there's also an on button and an off button, or you just choose not to watch it, listen to it. But yeah, I. it's funny you mentioned um, Boston Legal because not too long ago, I was sick and I was out. It was, it was during the COVID time. I rewatched oh, wow. the whole series while I was sick. I just said, I awesome. sat down. I haven't seen this because obviously people who don't know it was a spinoff of the practice, which I was watching right? that. And then I watched it when it was originally on the air. And I said, I love the show. So I said, it, it popped up. And I said, let me watch it again. I watched all whatever seasons there are. And the show to me was <laughs> just as funny as it was back then. I love James Spader. I love William Shatner. Was, they were those two were hilarious, and like you said, Denny Crane was a character, and he was in on the joke. And if they don't get it, well, that's their problem. I I love that show, and you're right, people would have been offended, but not now. And the sad thing is, the show came out, and it really wasn't that long ago when the show was out. Yeah, like how things have changed that quickly. Oh, totally. It's completely transformed. You never really know what you're in for until it's too late. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's cool, like you say, seeing the evolution of TV, though. Yeah, are you a, all right, so and you're about 20 years younger than me, so growing up, what were some of the shows that you liked? And movies? I, uh, I, shows I, would and movies. All, I would watch all kinds of things, Battlestar, Twilight Zone, and it was cool to see that, long story short, people were embracing just uh, just bingeable movies and shows before it was really a thing yet, and you know, by the time iTunes came out and started changing it up, I I, I knew movies and TV were going to keep being unpredictable. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what's funny? Because um, you mentioned Twilight Zone. That, to me, is probably like one of my all-time favorite shows of all time. And another plug, and I did interview Ann Sterling. Oh, wow. Ron Sterling's daughter. And you know yeah. what he? You know what I love what he said? Because he he's another one that had to go through all the censors and everything. And so he started writing shows that included aliens. He said an alien could say something a Republican or Democrat can't. And I love that. So that's yes. how he got a, around the censors. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. he, he knew that people would say, oh, my God, what are you saying this? What are you doing this for? And he just and, – and if you watch the show long enough, the big thing was he, he was in the – I think the Army – his father died and they wouldn't let him go to his father's funeral. So it's a lot of episodes you'll see where, you know, that's why there's so many military episodes. That makes better yes. sense. <laughs> military episodes and also going home and going back to the old times, like, you know, a Willoughby and all you could, I, I without even knowing I will be watching episodes. Like that seems like a Rod Serling episode and 99.9% .9 of the time I'm right. You just tell it. I mean, he's the narrator. So, I mean. yeah, well, he's a narrator, but he had some great writers. He had Richard Matheson, Charles mm -hmm. Beaumont, and so many others. And, uh, but you could tell like a Robert, uh, I mean, sorry, a Rod Serling episode, just cause you know, just the two things I mentioned, he, uh, he, he was, a, he loved the military and he missed going home. So the, a lot of his episodes have to deal with the, trying to go back to the old days and to his youth. But that show, I, I you know, for people who don't know, which I'm sure everybody does, New Year's Eve, they always have the marathons. Oh, I yes. never, ever, I, I, if I'm not home, I'll record them all. And I watch them, and it's just as entertaining as it was the first 15 times I've seen it. Totally. Yeah. And unheard of, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, and I love the, like, for me, so my favorite episodes were, did you ever see Telly Savalas with Talky Tina? Uh, not Talking Tina, but I, I definitely have seen a bunch of Kojak. <laughs> oh, yeah. With Ko Kojak. He, I, I love, actually, see, I, I grew up in the 70s, and I love all the 70s cop shows like Kojak, Police mm -hmm. Woman, Beretta. Oh, yes. <laughs> Adam 12. Fun stuff. Yeah. 
So, and, for, so, so you're more of a 90s movie person then, right? I mean, I'll, I've watched plenty of Eddie's shows too, you know, and, you know, St. Elsewhere, Hill Street Blues and all that. But I, I mainly am just like always blown away by how far we've come in storytelling and how everyone's getting a second chance now. You can still check out some of these various TV shows and movies. Oh, yeah. Uh, because they're streaming, fortunately. Uh, Highlander show, I found out, has actually really pretty well thought out for a fantasy show. Oh, so I, I never saw that one. I have to check that out. No, anytime. I, I mean, obviously, no, but that's what gets me so angry when I, whenever I'll mention something and somebody says, I don't know, I wasn't born then. It's like, well, I wasn't born during the Revolutionary War, but I know what happened. I, I wasn't born yeah. during the times that a Marx Brothers or W.C. Fields or uh, so many other TV shows like... Uh, very few are actually there. And even then, I mean, it's like everyone doesn't want to be constructive anymore. They just want to kind of just talk shit to each other. And I'm like, why? Why not, you know, embrace the fandom together instead of pissing each other off? <laughs> yep. Well, you know what's, you know, what I can't stand too is with uh, people are so afraid to be original and different. And they should learn from examples. As I mentioned two shows right there, one day, I mean, sorry, uh, Jefferson's in all the family, but also Seinfeld, they're completely nuts. And that show is so popular. Still, if people dare to be a little bit different, so instead of just jumping on the bandwagon and being so generic, like every other TV show, everybody's got the sarcastic kid, the father who's the Very loser. Dumb, it's just, it, yeah. <laughs> it's just every sitcom is the same. I the problem is is that I mean, the way the way it is now. Nobody really has to sit down and watch anything. And people have, I call it the ADD nation where everybody wants it. Yes. Oh, sound and, bites. and losing their patience before the next episode's out. I'm like, then why don't you just wait a month and binge it instead of just be a prick to everybody acting like you wronged me. You made the worst movie of all time. I'm pretty sure no one was trying to make the worst movie of all time, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, what? I love character development. I love a story that takes a Same. while to get going. Yeah. Because I like for an example would be somebody made this comment to me and I started laughing. Oh, well, let's, you know, let's watch the shine. Let's fast forward to the good parts. Like, whoa, whoa, whoa. What do you yeah. mean fast forward? The movie is a, I just want all the part jokes. Build. Yeah. <laughs> I love that movie. And you know, it's funny cause I'm, I'm sure you know the story about Stephen King, how he hates that movie. And Stanley Cooper actually had to put a gag order on him saying, if you bad mouth my movie anymore, I'm going to sue you. But the reason for that was because that movie was so personal. He was Jack Torrance. Jack Torrance was basically yeah. a biography of him. He was an alcoholic. He was a writer. It's just he was not was, playing around. He was just like, "Hey, you got a problem with me? Take it outside." <laughs> yeah, but it's something like Stephen. I I didn't meet Stephen King. I saw him speak in uh, at an auditorium, and he he has a great sense of humor about now. He was like, just it was my second novel. It was really personal to me. It, was, it but, took years though. <laughs> oh, it took a long time. But he's, the funny thing is, he says, "Well, guess what? I can say whatever I want now. I outlived the bastard." And he started laughing. He just he, he has a good sense of humor about it, but did and he said it took him a long time to because that that's why, which is funny because they he directed a TV version, and they originally wanted the guy from Wings, not Stephen Weber, but the other one, uh, Tim Daly. Yes, Tim Daly. Uh, and Tim Daly said, "There's no way I'm gonna take over Jack Nicholson's role." I, Everybody's going to remember Jack Nicholson. Nobody's going to, they're just going to trash me. And then they ask uh, Stephen Weber and he did it, which the movie yep. to me was not good at all. But yeah, I was, I love McGarris and everything. And he actually was on Dash from the Crypt podcast recently talking about it. Uh, he was confirming the Garrison East rumor. He's like, uh, no, we did not try him out. Yes, we had him in mind. But it is just so funny, too, how thanks to all these new YouTube channels, podcasts, and even uh, just more distinct uh, material. We're now getting the ins and outs about what actually beh happened behind the scenes instead of just all these other unpleasant surprises and ever persisting rumors. <laughs> oh yeah, no, definitely. I uh, I let, like I think McCare. See the one that did uh, the mist. Uh, no, that was Frank Darabont, but uh, Mick Garris, He did. Oh, Hunter's Darabont, Park. yeah. Focus, uh, amazing stories. Oh yeah, no, uh, that shining rehash, Masters of Horror, uh, Critters Two, and Nightmare Cinema, and even more Stephen King stuff like Riding the Bullet and Sleepwalkers. So yeah, he's pretty cool. I know. I definitely know. I definitely know who Mick Garris is. I just couldn't remember if he did The Mist. The reason I brought that up was because The Mist is another. Well, The Mist was a was a short story, and yeah, 
Frank Darabont, I lo- even Stephen King said, which I love the ending of the movie version. He goes, I never would have went that dark. And I just loved it. I remember when I came out, the, I was buying a ticket for the movie. Also, not, not even exaggerating when I say it. So I see three or four people. What the fuck? I can't fucking believe it. I said, oh, no, this is going to be good. And then at the end of the movie, I actually stood up and clapped. I said, this is great. This is reality. The ending was so great, so realistic. Mm-hmm. And it's just, it was took such a dark twist. And I love movies like that. That's why for me, I'm, I'm gonna, I want to get your opinion on this. What's your opinion on um, European movies or Italian movies? Oh, Jermaine, especially for going into uh, just uh, Giallo and Argento yes. type stuff. You know, I, I, if you really, anyone who says we are not inspired, oh, don't make us blush. There is no way even Brian De Palma or Scorsese or even Orson Welles weren't watching those back in the day. You know? Oh, yeah. Well, I love, yeah. Well, the reason I brought that up is because they're not afraid to end on a realistic down note. Yeah. And, and you know, I love, like, it's funny. Just recently I was watching uh, an Umberto Lanzo movie, I think his name is, but then I love. Yeah, the, he's the so movies. underrated. Yeah. And uh, the other one, I, was, I loved Lucio Fulci. I met, actually met him and Dario Gentro oh, years ago. Oh, man. I know. I wish so, I could yeah, I know. I fortunately, I mean, well, he could barely speak English, and he was so old, so he really wasn't saying too much. But I'm glad I was actually. You know, Isn't that so funny? How every other person was like so intimidated by him because it's like, and that's kind of dealt with like, kind of like how everyone would act like action movies are in causing you know idiots to kill each other. They would always act like horror movies are just you know the Antichrist, you know, kind of like metal, and it's just like. Are we seriously doing this right now? <laughs> I know like, it's so like like I always tell people. I said you know, part of when I was when I was seven think. years old, I was watching you know when I was seven years old, I was watching Jaws. Then I went eleven. Wait, what year did Evil Dead come out? Seventy nine. So I was eleven years old watching Evil Dead and Phantasm. <laughs> I I grew up pretty well. I actually, you know what? I think it made it made me more normal because i was so jaded by 12 and 13 knowing like this is not reality this is and i was nothing scared me nothing i was so jaded with these movies i'm like all right it was just entertaining i think that some so many people are like uh their their parents are like too strict and say oh you can't see this you can't watch that that makes them want to do it more and that will it's just i think it has the reverse effect yeah, but I can't stand when somebody is like, no, it had nothing to do with the movie. It's just the person was unstable or they're very weak. Yeah, or one studio is that was a horse's ass. And we've seen our share of that, where it's like even these studios will disown something before then to where it's like, oh, my God, why were you guys allowed to keep your job after you ruined it for everybody else? You know? Exactly. Like, no one else should have to face their career ending because you went into the editing room because... Uh, I just want more boobs. It's like, well, the movie's not going to make much sense, and it's going to get really old after the fact once your ego dies down. <laughs> yep, I know. I, I agree with that a thousand but percent. It's just underwhelming because uh, what can you do? <laughs> no, I think that everybody should just try to make the best movie. They- this is another thing that gets me mad about movies, and I think I, I think I want to say Kevin Smith, but there's other people that talked about. It where you, you put your blood, sweat, and tears years in the making, and then they have one audience, I forget what they call it, but the, like the preview audience that says, well, we don't like this. Take this out. We Change this. You're like, what? I just spent three years, and you watched it for an hour and 42 minutes, and you're telling yeah, me that to change everything around? Think about it real fast. And if you don't tell them what it's about, then it's already a missed opportunity. Is this like, I don't know, it's like, going into an amusement park and not realizing, oh, this is all campy and like a circus. And it's like, well, yeah, that's, that's kind of the point. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. And I just, it's, it's sad that, uh, as we mentioned before, it's like the way the world is for the most part, people, there's everything so safe and so generic because everybody's afraid, like, oh my God, if we do this, somebody, one person's going to be will offended. Bitch, someone will bitch. Oh. Yeah. Even though they're you know, always the, gonna bitch. Exactly. Somebody, yeah, and it's always been like that. But what they should do is somebody bitching, I think, will make the show more popular in a way. Sort of like the going back to music with the PMRC. I don't know if you remember that with uh Chipper Gore. 
<laughs> yeah. We're, it it made people want to buy the records like, oh, my God, what's this? This has a label. I want to hear what they have to say. I think that if you have, as they say, no that no publicity is, you know, or what's it? Bad publicity is good publicity, whatever the <laughs> saying is. Um, is people are talking about it. It's going to make people say, you know, I never even heard of this, but let, let me just check it out, see what everybody's talking about. So if they, if they play that angle instead of like bowing down and cowering at the first uh, insult, or sorry, the first critique they get. Right. They'll, they could probably, people forget about what, even the the complaint was, and they'll say, "Wow, you know, what? I actually like this. This is pretty good. I don't know what everybody's complaining about." Mm-hmm. And that's why, again, let's. I mean, the whole conversation started with John Carpenter's his movies. He just does what he likes, and I don't think he really cares if people like it or not. Oh, he's not even working anymore. He's just like, "Hey, I said what I said, and if you don't like it, who cares?" <laughs> What's well, funny is like I, think, I can't remember when it was, but there was a point where he says he goes, "I just don't even really like making movies anymore. I'm just making movies to make money." And uh, I think right? that was towards the end. But now what he does, and I was talking about this with Adrian Barbeau, and she says, "I never thought this would be interesting, but I saw it in concert." Uh, John and his son Cody go. I don't know if they still do it anymore. It's a couple of years ago. They play the. He wrote all the music for all his movies. They play the music. Mm-hmm. And on the back of the, sc- they have a big screen to show the movie, the clips from the movie as he's, they're playing the music. Is I was just watching it on YouTube last night. Uh, I, I I would love to have seen it live, but I, his music, just like his movies, so simplistic but so effective. Yes. Oh man, it's just like, unheard of too. <laughs> yeah, like who can free? Obviously, the Halloween theme is. So iconic. Yeah. <laughs> Post I mean, yeah. But but even watching like Prince of Darkness last night, it's just like dun dun dun. Like dun dun dun. It's so simple, but when you're watching it with the movie, it it builds the suspense. You're like, oh my God, what's gonna happen next? <laughs> yeah. So I yeah, so I'm not sure exactly what he's doing now. I think he's just retired, but I know that he was doing that with his son for a little while. <laughs> Quite some time, yeah. What was and that? For for some time, yeah. Yeah. So, do you have? Um, are Are you a big horror fan? Oh, totally. I right. I get annoyed at all these culture wars we're still having. Like, uh, you'll always like just like how you'll say you'll we we encounter people who like just want like mindlessness but are so cynical they'll even complain about mindlessness. I, I, I'm kind of the same way where I'm just like, okay, you know what you're in for. Just, you know, just be professional. Just be constructive. Just w- Or wait a bit. If you don't feel like you're ready to talk about the movie, you know, force yourself to watch it again. Or just say, hey, it wasn't for me. Glad it entertained you instead of this gatekeeping saying anyone who likes this is a fucking idiot i'm like well yeah. nice dude nice <laughs> you just well per- perfect example of that is uh senator robert dole when pulp fiction came out it's oh, he's yeah. like this should not be made this should be taken out of the theaters they said um did you see the movie well i didn't actually see it but i heard about it so how can you bad mouth it and say it should be taken out of theaters and it has no moral value if you never even saw it and i think a lot more people are like that They'll just jump on the complaining bandwagon and mm-hmm. they have no idea what they're talking about. And if, again, as we, we keep going back and forth with or back to this, if you don't like it, then don't even see it. Don't even, nobody's forcing and putting a gun to your head saying, you got to watch this movie. If you don't like Lucio Fulci with, um, with zombies, no one's force, forcing you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I personally love that stuff, but then I love the cerebral horror like Dario Argento. Mm-hmm. I, I like, the, I like pretty much everything. And I think so many people are just so narrow-minded when it comes to like, I only like metal music. I only like horror movies. I only like arrogant or yeah. Yes. I actually had to unfriend a few different sci-fi and horror podcasts just because we would get people like that or in their mind, it was easy. And it's like, okay, well you're retired. Last I checked, we aren't. (laughs) I think you can chill instead of just acting like, Oh, if you don't get it, you're just an idiot. I'm like, or maybe I just don't have time to watch this right now, but exactly. I will make time. But yeah, it's no, no, everyone's it's, got an issue. Everyone's got some predicament. Everybody's just 
Yeah, well, no, well you're, you're, it reminds me of years ago. I was in a metal band, and were you really? All, yeah, and all my friends, the people in the band were. Well, I wanted to, I wanted to do a version of Cherry Jack's Seasons in the Sun, and everybody's laughing. I'm like, you guys, there's a lot more to life than Metallica and Megadeth. This was back in '88. Yeah, I said, they so were not the great, first. So much great music out there, you're missing out on, and it's funny because. I think most people, not not most people, some people are afraid to admit they like other things. It's like, who really can? I'll give you an example. As of what if I mean. they're being judged. And it's like, yeah. well, you liked it. You collected all the albums. It's yeah. a part of you as all this other mainstream stuff. <laughs> well, one time I went into this store and I heard the woman singing. Um, they had Wham, Wake Me Up Before You Go-Go. And she, <laughs> I caught her singing and she goes, uh, I started laughing and she goes, hey, you know, when you hear a song, you, you don't really like it, but it's just, you know, it's sort of catchy. I said, I actually like that you song. Oh, yeah, like so do I, so do I. Oh so as soon God. as I gave her permission to like it, then she's like, oh yeah, no, I love that song too. Said, but she was afraid that I was going to judge. Who cares? I said, That's why Who when cares? people say, what's your guilty pleasure? I don't really have any guilty pleasures. I just have pleasures. I'm not, I can really care less what people think. I like so many, I can go from, we're just for talking about Same music. I can go from Slayer to care. the Carpenters to Mozart in ten minutes. I don't <laughs> exactly. care. Exactly. Exactly. And, exactly. And I I love all kinds of things. So it's just like with movies, I love all kinds of movies. Like last night, I watched the Book Club too. But then last week, I saw Evil Dead Rise. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. But I uh, definitely, and I'm sure your your audience is uh, well aware of the uh, the Pliskin and the other whole John Carpenter catalog, but. He definitely, if I had to pick like an all-time favorite, you know, not it's not all-time favorite of all time, but he's definitely up there for some of the best movies, best classic movies I like. It's John Carpenter, like movies that will be remembered, and just uh, they're I don't know, I, I, like for me, I think like you, you mentioned, they live. I love Escape from New York, I, but then I was trying to think of like if I have a favorite. I mean, I even watching The Fog the other day, I haven't seen that in years, and it was playing in the theater. I saw that brought back so many memories. Like, wow, I forgot how good this movie was. So it's it's almost hard for me to pick a favorite of his. <laughs> right. <laughs> to go the only one I'm, I'm not really. I mean, I can't remember. I'd have to, maybe I'd like it now. Would be Vampires. I don't remember if I liked that one or not. It's a like it or hate it. We were actually we did a review of it. And we were kind of actually fond of the sequel of Bon Jovi, but yeah, they're. I mean, you are you are what you eat. You know, you know at the end of the day if you like it or not. Yeah. Well, the thing is, for me, I can't remember because I I saw it once in the theater, and I'm trying. I I hate to say it, I don't remember anything about it, but that's why if I was I I would want to watch it again before I even said anything. But I'm I can't really remember walking out of a Carpenter movie saying, hmm, "I hate this movie." I never, <laughs> I've never said that. Uh, uh, what's your what's your opinion of the Rob Zombie Halloweens? Oh, I mean, Zombie seems like an ideal nice guy, likes his music and everything. His movies, it seems like he gets so close every time, and then he either just goes, gets too unpleasant, or just confuses you to death. So I guess if I had to put it nicely, he just seems very much about um, just... I think he does too many drugs, but not the kind that Carpenter did. <laughs> well, no, for me, I thought he tried too hard with Halloween, where I don't really care about what his childhood was like. He's the boogeyman. He kills people. You mm-hmm. can't kill him. That's all you need to know. That's why I loved about the John Carpenter movies, that how simplistic it was. You just didn't Kinda need... Kind of like the Terminator all- instead of all this extra, we got to make it look realistic. Like I mean, I'm, I, I can't say I'm even crazy about the new movies either because it seems like those ones were it's like they they were trying to fix the problems and then make all the other sequels non-canon and then they were adding all this other stuff to where it's like so why did you disown that if you're referencing these non-canon sequels it's like too many cooks <laughs> oh i know yeah i, you know, funny, I didn't even see the last one yet the uh, supposedly that's the uh the final one did you very see it? little to do with anything <laughs> yeah wasn't it something about a young boy i think right he was like was it a copycat or, or was that another one kind of but yeah that's, i don't remember or some, somebody told me about it. i just had zero interest in seeing it maybe i'll see it when it's on you know one of the streaming services for free but i did not rush out to see it i agree with you on that yeah, and then it's like you see him in interviews oh show nothing that's more scary i'm like mm. 
I don't know if it's <laughs> more scary. <laughs> It sounds like yeah. you're causing just doing lazy writing. I mean, without without Halloween, you don't get the Terminator. That that's another thing to be uh, have some interest in. <laughs> yeah, well, what do you what do you mean by that? Like, what do you? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you never heard of that? How James Cameron said he was inspired by both Star Wars and Halloween when making the Terminator. Oh no, I, I didn't hear that. So, yeah, funny. without either of those, you don't get a whole totally different sci-fi horror movie. <laughs> Well, you know, it's funny that most people put this down, but I actually love Season of the Witch. And I think the reason people put it down was that they, because they attached Halloween name to it. It really wasn't supposed to be a Halloween movie. Mm -hmm. But Halloween through the Season of the Witch, I remember seeing it in the theaters when it first came out. And I didn't know at the time I read, you know, obviously years later, what he was, uh, he had a contract to do like a movie every year. And then Michael Myers took off. So when he was doing Season of the Witch, they just attached Halloween 3 to it to get people into the seats. But that, the movie is good. I, I enjoy it. And Tom Atkins is hilarious. I met him before, too. He really too, is. Yeah. Every movie is like one of my favorite. He always has, he talked about, you know, having great lines. I loved in that one. Hey, so where are you going to sleep? Where do you want me to sleep? He's always getting the woman. Like even in uh, The Fog, when I was watching, I was laughing because he picks up Jamie Lee Curtis as a hitchhiker. And next scene, they're in bed together. It's like, this guy gets all the all the ladies. <laughs> yeah. It's in his contract. <laughs> it's, it's funny, man. I just, I just, I loved his characters. And then, of course, he was in Escape from New York. John Carpenter used him a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I mean, it makes sense why he's in Maniac. He's everywhere. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I, I, that's that's another. I, I love the Maniac Cop movies. You feel like they're in the same universe as uh, Evil Dead in a way. <laughs> yes. And Bruce Campbell, I forgot which one he is, but I think he is in one of the he's, Maniac Cops. Yeah, he's he, in the first two. And yeah. Okay. He, He's not close to it, and all you can say is, hey, oh, Bruce, but you make bad movies worth watching. <laughs> well, you're going to love this. Um, the year was 1990, and they were promoting... I was at the Fangoria Convention in New York, and they were promoting um, the uh, Army of Darkness, which came out in 91. Oh, how sweet. So my, my friends and I were just hanging out in the hotel that where they had the convention, <laughs> and it was around 2 o'clock in the morning, and the elevator opens up. And out walks Linnea Quigley, Bruce Campbell, and Gunnar Hansen. And we're like, <laughs> so I don't, we're just joking around. I'm like, hey, Bruce, are there any cool parties? Yeah, man, just, uh, just there's one on the eighth floor. So I can go, yeah, just tell them you know me. So my friends and I went up there. There's nothing on that floor but janitor closets. So yeah. next, I got I to gotta send this picture to you. But after I tell you a story, I'm gonna, I'll send the pictures to you. Uh, so we, the next day I saw him. I say, Bruce, yeah, thanks about the party. So he had his wife or his girlfriend with him. He goes, honey, this is the asshole I was talking about last night. So I have a picture where I'm choking him. And then I he wrote, I have an Evil Dead shirt. And it says, Rich, see you at the party. Love Ash. The guy was hilarious. It just, he, is, he is just like he is in the movies. Oh, he is a total, yeah, just very, he, he will prank you if you're not careful. <laughs> oh, yeah, and he, he definitely is so appreciative of his fans, and he just, he's, he's a great guy. I, I'm mad that I interviewed one of the ladies from Evil Dead, and unfortunately, the person who was running my podcast lost that interview, and it's lost ah. for good, and I, I know, I'm so mad about that. I had that, and I had um, Deputy Hendrix from Jaws. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's another one that got lost. But uh, but yeah, Bruce, I've met several times. Now it's almost impossible to get near him because he's so popular. When you go there, it's like he, you know, he's nowhere. You, the line will be three blocks long. But I, I luckily had a chance to see him when he was still he was popular, but he wasn't that big. You know, like I saw him when Evil Dead Two was released, but Army of Darkness wasn't yet out yet. Nice, but he was warming up for it. He was probably getting yeah. all the. I mean, you can't blame him for being a smart ass because it's like he he walked into the most accidental career, so he was kind of like, "Yeah, this is all happening." I wish I was making this shit up. <laughs> well, you know what I love? Sam Raimi says biggest influence. And if you watch Army of Darkness, you could see it. His biggest influence are the Three Stooges, and oh, I just, absolutely, yeah. yeah. I just I love his thing. That's why I I, I got mad with uh because Tobey Maguire Spider Man I like that one the best because I had that Sam Raimi sense of humor in there. People are like, Oh, this is stupid. I said, you just don't get it. I said, this is, this is classic Raimi. And the people <laughs> didn't know who he was. 
didn't get it. And I, you know, I'm noticing that a lot. It's like, you know, the character, but not the filmmaker is like, okay, aren't you the, the same guys who give people shit if they don't know who Scorsese or Spielberg is? It's just amazing how it kind of comes in waves. <laughs> yeah. But it's, oh. that's just, unfortunately, you know, people know like what Spielberg does for the most part. People know what Scorsese does, but like people that Sam Raimi wasn't mainstream in the very beginning. Sort of like Peter Jackson. I love the old Dead Alive movies, mm-hmm. Bad Taste. I love the old horror movies. And that's why I love the fact that Sam Raimi actually went back to horror with Drag Me to Hell. Like he went oh, back to even the- even Doctor Strange too. I was just like, see, this is yes. why I like this most because this is the only one willing to take a chance. Yep, that, I do. I love that. I love that Bob because when I realized, here's when I realized what a great director <laughs> he is with Simple Plan. Oh man! When I saw that movie. I said, oh my god, this to me that's like, I mean, I love all the Evil Dead movies. I love all the other movies he did. A simple plan is just so good. Oh yeah, it's a rarity too. <laughs> like you, you very rarely see that kind of well thought out kind of psychological heist film nowadays. Yeah, where everybody realizes, you know, in a neo western way, hey, we're about to literally end our life. And it showed like how money could just tear people apart. I mean, yeah, brother killing brother. I mean, I mean no glamorization. Yeah, very easy to modify for TV. It was on quite a lot. I, I knew so many people who had seen the book as well as the. Sh- it was kind of like LA Confidential. Even if you hadn't seen read the book, like if you saw the movie, you pretty much got the basic meat and potatoes of the story and the nuance and the themes. But yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, the book he would, the the brother was actually colder. Like and you know, Bill Paxton had more empathy in the movie. In the book, he was just cold blooded. I I read yeah, that. So book. I love that book. Yeah, I, I mean, know. it would have been better had they had Campbell or even uh, <laughs> some of these other guys in there. Maybe Kurt Russell could have been the oh, I know. <laughs> that, the main role. But yeah, I mean, Paxton was good casting. That That's definitely one of his essential roles. Yeah. Well, you know, that's what I love about Sam Raimi is that he's another one that he just appreciates. He knows where he came from. I mean, he and Bruce were friends since they were teenagers. He, Ted Raimi, Sam Raimi, and he has them. Um, it could be a cameo, but he's in pretty much every movie. Except for, that's probably the only one I thought I could think of that he wasn't in at all. But even Doctor Strange, he's at the very end, or he's in the middle, but he's at the very end to, with this, where his hands going crazy. Yeah. Uh, it's just, uh, so I love the fact that he will put him in, like, in some Spider-Man's, he was a ref, and he was a bodyguard, the guy, the I'm okay man. with him being picky, because it's like, when you've had so many people offer you all these movies, and you're like, and what do I get out of it? Oh, it's just crap. Okay, no thanks. You know, <laughs> yeah. he has the right to be picky at this point because, you know, he doesn't want to risk the gamble of becoming the next Shatner where, you know, you're in a bunch of movies and then you're in a bunch of shit and then you're in a bunch of good movies. Now you're in bad movies again after the career resurrection. I think he doesn't want to have all these constant just second guessing. He's just like, put me, I'm only going to work with someone who just, everybody's just cool with i'm cool with and it's i don't have to second guess myself (laughs) yeah exactly and i for the most part i I really the only movie i've not seen of his was um i think it was called for the love of the game with kevin costner yeah and i don't know i don't know if you know the story about that but he said kevin costner basically took over the whole movie and sam raimi said this will be the only time and the last time i ever let that happen i'm never gonna let somebody take the movie over he learned his lesson from that so, but that's that's the only Sam Raimi movie I've never seen of his. But I, I it's enjoy. very less of a Raimi movie. You get his moments here and there, but like you say, it was kind of just. At, at, unfortunately, that's how it is with some stars. The minute they're involved, they they want to run every gamble, and it's like, well, this isn't exactly your show to run, but I guess we got to surrender if you're going to be a dick. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Well, I think the most most um, popular story would be uh, Cop Out with uh, Kevin uh, Hart, not yeah. Kevin Hart um, with, with Bruce Tracy Wilson, Morgan and Bruce Wilson. Tracy Morgan. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, I actually, I did stand up comedy for a while and I met a comic that I worked with that he was, uh, he was in that movie. He, like it's either a, you know, a cameo or some background, whatever he was, he was in the movie, but they used to call Kevin Smith, the assistant director, because they said Bruce Campbell and, and uh, not Bruce Campbell, Bruce Willis, well, well, I've heard, well, 
let's go back. Kevin Smith has these, uh, he goes to colleges and people ask him questions and he'll answer the questions. I don't know if you've ever seen these. He had, they're on YouTube, but he's comes out with DVDs of it. And, um, Did so you follow one, Bruce's recent retirement? Apparently he's just, he's, so yeah, he's, he's crying. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, yeah, I feel, that, I feel bad. I, and Kevin Smith feels bad now, but like at the time he just, there was one at one special that was three hours long it was only one question they said what was it like working with bruce wells and that was it that was the one question that lasted three hours but yeah he said that you know but even sylvester stallone fired him from the expendables because he just didn't want to he was just being difficult so i feel bad for what he's going through now that's completely different from what, what he did back in the 80s and 90s mm-hmm. and 2000s but yeah it's just uh the reason i'm bringing that up was it's very similar to what kevin costner did with sam raimi because he would say Kevin Smith would say, well, I want you to do this. He goes, listen, how long have I been doing it? How long have you been doing it? I'm doing it the way I want to do it. And he just would go on, would go on and on like that. And it's just, I don't know, it's, it's tough because you're the director. People are looking to you to find out what's going on. And, and then if you, you take it over, everyone will start bullying you. So, yeah. It's... Exactly. Yeah. You, you, you have to keep control of your own movie because then nobody's going to have respect for you. And it's, it's tough when you have a star like that. Because the producer's like, well, you know, we're not going to make the movie without him because he's he's the money maker, right? Just put, just suck it up. Even though it's kind of hard to when they're refusing to do everything. When you got to film it with their stand-in, oh man, yeah. yeah. Good luck making the editor work with this. And you know what? Uh, when I interviewed uh, Windows from the thing, Tom G. Waits, he said that Kurt oh, Russell wow. had to be the nicest actor he ever worked with. We talked about the thing for a little while. He said, like, Kurt Russell was so professional. He was so funny. He was so helpful to everybody on the set. It just made everybody feel um, comfortable. And that's Unheard of nowadays. Should... Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like, because he, he, Kurt Russell's been around <laughs> from the Disney days as a teenager, probably before that, as a little kid. So he's, he's been doing this for a long time. And he could have the biggest ego in the world, but he, he doesn't have to. And he... He makes great movies and he doesn't have to be an asshole about it. Right? Unheard of nowadays. I know, unfortunately. Follow us on the web on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. The podcast is available on Podbean, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Anchor, Apple, and anywhere else podcasts are available. Feel free to review our show and leave comments on any of those sites. Thanks a million for listening. It's a jacked up review show.